Vladimir Putin's interview with Tucker Carlson, which has received 200 million views so far, will go down into history as the most watched interview of a political leader in the world. Putin spent more than two hours laying out a worldview that's born out of the tension and power struggle between the unipolar and the multipolar world order. Putin's main message is that the rise of the multipolar world is inevitable. But what are the two key assumptions behind his assessment? Is it possible that he's too optimistic about China and too pessimistic about the dollar? What do the numbers and facts tell us? Putin's interview with Tucker last week confirmed what we already knew. The world is rapidly falling into two opposing camps. Putin likened the polarizing world to a human brain divided into two disconnected hemispheres. He described it as an illness, a serious adverse condition. Whether you agree with Putin or not, he attributes the polarization of the world to American arrogance. He gave examples of how the US under successive administrations, spurned Moscow's offer of rapprochement after the collapse of the Soviet Union. He talked about how he approached Bill Clinton in 2000 about joining NATO, only to be told that it would not be possible. He talked about how the US under Bush provided financial and military support to separatist terrorist groups in the caucus over repeated objections from Russia. He talked about being promised time and again by Washington that NATO expansion will never happen, only to see NATO moving closer to the Russian border after five waves of expansion. When Tucker asked him why he thought the West had rebuffed Russia's overture, this is what he had to say. You said I was bitter about the answer. No, it's not bitterness. It's just a statement of fact. We're not bride and groom, bitterness, resentment. It's not about those kind of matters in such circumstances. We just realized we weren't welcome there, that's all. Okay, fine. If we received such a negative response, you should ask your leaders. I can only guess why. Too big a country with its own opinion and so on. I've seen how issues are being resolved in NATO. The US leadership exerts pressure and all NATO members obediently vote even if they do not like something. Whether Putin was bitter or not, he was definitely defiant. He made it quite clear that if the civilized West didn't want Russia to be part of it, Russia would forge his own path. Putin spent much time talking about the rapid growth of the BRICS group, of which Russia is serving as the current president. If memory serves me right, Back in 1992, the share of the G7 countries in the world economy amounted to 47 percent, whereas in 2022 it was down to, I think, a little over 30 percent. The BRICS countries accounted for only 16 percent in 1992, but now their share is greater than that of the G7. Central to Putin's worldview is the ascendancy of the BRICS. It is like the rise of the sun. You cannot prevent the sun from rising. You have to adapt to it. How do the United States adapt? With the help of force, sanctions, pressure, bombings, and use of armed forces. This is about self-conceit. Your political establishment does not understand that the world is changing under objective circumstances. And in order to preserve your level, even if someone aspires, pardon me, to the level of dominance, you have to make the right decisions in a competent and timely manner. Putin's confidence in the ascendancy of the BRICS, notwithstanding US sabotage, rests on two key assumptions. One, Putin judges China's rise to be unstoppable. 
The West is afraid of strong China more than it fears a strong Russia. Because Russia has 150 million people and China has 1.5 billion population, and its economy is growing by leaps and bounds, or 5% a year, it used to be even more. But that's enough for China. As Bismarck once put it, potentials are the most important. China's potential is enormous. It is the biggest economy in the world today in terms of purchasing power parity and the size of the economy. It has already overtaken the United States quite a long time ago, and it is growing at a rapid clip. Two, Putin thinks the weaponization of the US dollar by the Biden administration will backfire on America in the long run. You know, to use the dollar as a tool of foreign policy struggle is one of the biggest strategic mistakes made by the US political leadership. The dollar is the cornerstone of the United States power. I think everyone understands very well that no matter how many dollars are printed, they are quickly dispersed all over the world. As soon as the political leadership decided to use the US dollar as a tool of political struggle, a blow was dealt to this American power. Look at what is going on in the world. Even the United States allies are now downsizing their dollar reserves. Seeing this, everyone starts looking for ways to protect themselves. Until 2022, US dollars accounted for approximately 50% of our transactions with third countries. Well, currently it is down to 13%. The power struggle between the US-led unipolar world and its multipolar challengers is the biggest story in the world today and will likely remain so for the years to come. Putin is right that which side will win will depend critically on China and the US dollar. But are Putin's assumptions of a strong China and a weak dollar supported by facts and numbers? The outlook for China and the outlook for the US dollar are intricately connected. Unlike stocks and bonds, currencies have only a relative value and not an absolute one. The dollar can go down only if there's another currency to go up against it. Is the Chinese RMB ready to challenge the dollar's reserve currency status? This is an important question only because an appreciation of the RMB against the US dollar is a necessary condition for a general decline of the US dollar. A necessary condition because the US and China are the two biggest importers in the world. No country can afford to have their currencies go up against the currencies of their two biggest customers at the same time and on a persistent basis. Unless, of course, they want to commit economic suicide. Surely not even Putin wants that for Russia. The foreign exchange market gets the joke. And this is why the implied correlation between the dollar and the RMB is very high, even against another major currency like the euro. The bottom line is that for the dollar to fall, the RMB has to go up. Put differently, for the BRICS currencies to challenge the US dollar, the RMB has to challenge the US dollar. So what are the chances that the RMB will challenge the US dollar anytime soon? Let's say before Putin, who's currently 71, turns 80. Putin said in the Tucker interview that the US cannot stop printing money. But the Federal Reserve has been shrinking its balance sheet over the past two years. What Putin probably meant was the massive US budget deficit. He was right about that. Everyone agrees that the biggest structural problem the US dollar is facing is the spiraling US government debt that is now at $34 trillion. Let's be more precise about this problem. If the stock of US debt is growing faster than the stock of debt of other countries, investors would demand higher risk premium for holding US debt. This higher risk premium is likely to involve a weaker US dollar. If relative supply of debt is an important driver of exchange rates, what about China's debt? China's general government debt is about 40% lower than that of the US. China's household debt is about 25% lower than that of the US. 
However, China's corporate debt is 60% higher than that of the US. At the end of 2022, China's total debt is 271% of GDP versus US total debt at 281% of GDP. Indeed, what Putin does not mention is that China has as big a debt problem as the US today. Bigger. Bigger because rich countries can afford more debt. And China's debt is very high relative to China's per capita GDP. If the biggest problem facing the US dollar is the size of US debt, and the only currency that could potentially challenge the dollar hegemony is the RMB, the fact that China has a bigger debt problem than the US means the US dollar domination is still pretty safe. The size of China's massive debt is posing a growing risk to the Chinese economy. By the way, if Xi Jinping gets any credit for China's economic policy under his watch, it is that he's at least more cautious about taking on even more debt. Whereas his predecessors piled on more and more debt without thinking about their long-term consequences. Xi Jinping has to consider the long-term consequences of the debt bubble, that is if he wishes to remain China's president for life. For economic or for selfish reasons, Xi seems determined to rein in China's debt growth. However, slower debt growth means slower economic growth. Economists are forecasting 4.6% GDP growth in 2024, down from 5.2% in 2023. But slower growth will not solve Xi's problem. In fact, it might just exacerbate it. The biggest problem with slower economic growth is that it weakens the creditworthiness of debtors. Slower growth means that companies and households will have more difficulty servicing and repaying their debt. At the end of 2023, Beijing blacklisted 8.6 million borrowers who had missed payments on everything from home mortgages to business loans. This represented a 50% increase from the beginning of 2020. As delinquencies and defaults go up, debt holders are forced to write down losses. All throughout 2023, Chinese banks reported rising non-performing loans. In 2023, issuance of securities backed by non-performing loans jumped by about 40% from the previous year. Rising non-performing loans have made the banks more cautious about lending. This is the reason why China's money multiplier declined last year, despite further cuts in reserve requirement. This is evidenced also by the fact that bank lending to property developers fell again in Q4, despite growing pressure on the banks from the government to step up lending, including on an unsecure basis. Problems that didn't matter so much when China was growing at 8 to 10% are now mattering much more. Slower economic growth is exposing the problems that were hidden in the past by high growth rate. And the biggest shoe has not even dropped yet. House prices have been falling, but very gradually. But in December, home prices fell at their fastest rate in nine years. China's home prices are the highest in the world as a multiple of household income. High and rising home prices in China have been a key driver of debt growth over the past 10 years. High home prices mean high collateral value, which allows debtors to borrow more. High home prices by driving up land prices provided local governments with a high revenue source to borrow against. Declining home prices lead to declining collateral value in declining land prices. All of this will only serve to weaken economic growth further. In other words, the transition from high debt growth to low debt growth itself is fraught with risks. What is very clear is that China needs much lower interest rates. With the growing risk of deflation, China should lower interest rates to zero. So why hasn't China brought interest rates to zero already? The answer is very simple, because we still live in a world dominated by the US dollar. Dollar hegemony means that unless the Federal Reserve is cutting interest rates, any country who tries to get ahead of the Fed will see their currencies depreciate against the US dollar. The fact that this remains so is the clearest evidence that the dollar has not lost any of its power. 
So what is the big deal of a weaker RMB? Why should a weaker RMB stop China from cutting interest rates to zero to help ease the transition to slower debt growth? I don't know the answer, but I can offer three hypotheses. One, a weaker RMB could give the US even more excuses to pile up tariffs on Chinese imports. Two, a weaker RMB could accelerate outflows of foreign capital that has already wiped trillions from the Chinese stock market. Chinese and Hong Kong equities saw a combined net outflows of almost $4 billion in December, the highest in 2023 and third highest on record. Three, Xi Jinping does not want his fellow BRICS countries, including his friend Putin, to question the RMB as a store of value and as an alternative to the US dollar. I don't think Xi needs to worry too much about US tariffs in a US election year. Biden needs lower and not higher inflation. I think foreign outflows are the result of Chinese policy paralysis. Beijing needs to worry less about the stock market and worry more about the economy. Direct interventions by Beijing in the stock market are accelerating outflows by giving foreigners a get out of jail card at a subsidized price. I was brought up by Chinese parents and I know something about pride. Chinese are famous for caring a lot, maybe too much in my view, about their pride. No doubt a weaker RMB will make China and Xi Jinping look bad in front of the other BRICS countries, including friends like Putin. But if Xi Jinping does not act soon, looking bad will be the least of his problems. Thank you for listening. If you got something out of this program, please hit like and subscribe to my free YouTube channel. Let me know what you think by posting your comments on the video. If you want to learn more about my investment strategy, come visit us at davidwuunbound.com.